Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come into your house and to worship. Sing praises to you, Lord. Lord, hear your word delivered by your servant. Lord, let us be obedient to the words that we hear today. And let others see the Christ in us. Lord, we thank you for everything that's been bestowed upon us, Lord. It's only through you that we have the opportunity to proclaim your name to those that do not know who you are. Lord, in this time that we're going through, Lord, it is through your mercy and your grace that sees us through. Lord, we ask you that as this year continues on, that we hold faith to the highest areas, Lord, knowing that you are the only true God, and through you that a brighter day and a better time is on the horizon. Lord, let us celebrate you today from the depths of our hearts. In our son Jesus' name we pray.
I want to welcome you this morning. We, we actually made it through this week, so we're here Amen. to praise God and just thank him for just his mercies throughout this week. It was tough for a lot of people, but yet God is in control. We should never forget that. Also today, I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, right after the service is our um, uh, church council meeting. So those of you on the church council, please make plans to stay. Also this evening, we'll be having our evangelism training. So um, uh, Brother Dale has some things uh, fixed for that, and I have a presentation. So don't, uh, don't uh, forget about us this evening. The, the day's great. It's not raining, snowing, freezing, or whatever. Perfect time to spend in God's house. Then as you uh, look um, in the bulletin itself, uh, we have our midweek Bible study that's going on. Uh, are we having Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday uh, we will meet here in the church at 6 for a review of the uh, weekly Bible study. So don't forget about that. Join us then. So, Brother Bill, if you could uh, come on up and take over. stand for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. Would you read with me please? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command 
and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You may be seated. Almighty God, you are our protector, our provider. You sustain us. You sustain this world. We thank you for your protection, your love this week, that you were with us the whole time, that no matter what would go on around us, you were always present. We look forward to the time when you come and rule in righteousness and truth with a government that will work correctly. In your gracious name, amen. As we go into the stewardship portion of our service today, our thought comes out of Exodus 19, and, and God is telling his people that if you will just obey me fully and keep my commands, that out of everyone in the whole world, you will remain my treasured possession. And, and one of the commands that God gives us is to give. Because he says that, um, you know, we, it, it's part of our responsibility. You know, the, the, the Lord loves a joyful giver. And this is what we learn. When we study the Bible and, and read it, we learn from God how to give. Because we give when we recognize that God owns everything. And it's through this thought that we are just managers of his possessions that should um, you know, shed light on what we're doing. We should be saying to God every day, thank you for letting me use what belongs to you. And sometimes we forget that. We think it's ours, but it's not ours. Everything belongs to God, and that's what stewardship is about. Thanking God through our tithes and offerings and giving, recognizing that we wouldn't have anything if it weren't for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to, to just be blessed by giving. And we just ask that you continue to watch over us and guide us. And just uh, as we continue our service, help our minds be ever focused on you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, I'm so happy to be back in the house of the Lord. You know, last week we um, didn't have in service because it was just a, a little under the weather. But, you know, we still managed to get a service out there, you know, for everyone to see. So, you know, God is great. You know, that's what we have to understand. Now, as we're continuing our series today, we're looking at another mark of a mighty church. And that mark that we're looking at today is that uh, a mighty church is an anticipating church. Now, what do we anticipate? We anticipate that Jesus is coming again. And Jesus has assured us that he is coming. And when we get into uh, 1 Thessalonians here, Paul addresses that very thing because the second coming of Christ was something to which the Thessalonian church eagerly looked forward. Now, last week we saw in chapter 4 that, that Paul addressed or praised the church for uh, avoiding lust and uh, uh, adopting love and applauding labor. And then the week before that, in chapters 2 and 3, Paul described uh, uh, the Thessalonian church as a scriptural church, a suffering church, and a strong church. And in the beginning of this series, in chapter 1, we see Paul praising them for being an energetic church, an elect church, an evangelistic church, and an expectant church. You know, that's that anticipating church. They were an expectant church because 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says they were eagerly looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. Now, the second half of chapter 4 and the first half of chapter 5 expand on that very idea. Paul explains what the Thessalonians had to look forward to and what mighty churches of every generation can still look forward to. Let me read you 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. In other words, those who have died. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have already fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What we see in this passage is that Paul identifies four more elements or four elements of the second coming that Christians can anticipate. And that's what's so, so fascinating and so great about God's word. We can, can understand, you know, what's going to happen. So first, Paul tells us, that a mighty church anticipates Christ's return. Now, I ran across a news article the other day, 
and the, the, the headline said, Man Experiences Heart Attack After the Rapture. Now think about that. Now this is what, what it reads. Herbert Washington whom co-workers at Significant Plastics Incorporated said was unduly concerned with the rapture and the second coming of Christ. He suffered a serious heart attack when co-workers pretended they had been caught away without him. Last Tuesday, they laid work outfits on their chairs and hid in a supply room when he uh, went to the restroom. And when he came back, he thought the rapture had occurred. The janitor, an outspoken Muslim, pretended to had witnessed everyone disappearing around uh, the office and he was feigning panic and, and fright. Herbert fell to the ground, clutching his heart. Martha, I'm coming, you know. And screaming, I knew you'd forget me, Jesus. The poor guy underwent bypass surgery and is recovering well. His wife says he's reading the Bible more than ever now. <laughs> now, while it might make for entertaining movies and heart-stopping pranks, the reality is this. The Bible never speaks of a secret rapture where, where faithful Christians just disappear and unbelievers are left behind. Rather, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians uh, 4.16 that we read just a little earlier, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And Revelations 1.7 even adds, look, he is coming with the clouds, every eye will see him. Now, just imagine you're driving home one day from work, and your thoughts wander to the game that you want to see that evening, or, or where you're going to go out to eat, when suddenly there's a sound unlike anything you've ever heard. The sound is, is high, it, it, it's above you. You know, is it a trumpet, a choir, a, a choir of trumpets? You don't know, but you want to know. So what do you do? You pull over, you get out of the car, and, and you look up to see what's happening. And as you do, you see you're not the only one curious. The roadside is just littered. It's like a parking lot. Doors are open, people are staring at the sky, shoppers are racing out of the grocery store, the Little League baseball game across the street has come to a halt, players and parents are searching the sky and looking, and what they see and what you see has never been seen before. As if the sky were a curtain, the drapes of the atmosphere just part. A brilliant light splits onto the earth, followed by an endless fleet of angels. Thousands of silvery wings rise and fall in unison. Over the sound of the trumpets, you can hear the cherubim and the seraphim chanting, Holy, holy, holy. You know, suddenly, movement stops and the trumpets are silent. All is quiet. You know, the angels turn, you turn, the entire world turns, and there he is, Jesus. Through waves of light, you see the silhouetted figure of Christ the King. Before you stands a figure so consuming that instantly you know nothing matters. Forget stock markets, school reports, sales meetings, football games, nothing's newsworthy anymore. All that mattered matters no more, for Christ has come. Now, will it be like that? I don't know. But I know 
that when Jesus does come, everyone will know it. And everyone will be amazed. You know, this is why mighty churches anticipate Jesus' return. Now, furthermore, a mighty church anticipates the resurrection. You know, and this, and we're just not talking about Easter. We're talking about our body being resurrected. Paul assured the Thessalonians in verse 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this thought of the resurrection raises a lot of questions. In fact, Paul anticipated uh, uh, as much as he could on the questions in his letter to the Corinthians. He writes in 1 Corinthians 15.35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body, you know, will, you know, will, will they have? You know, thankfully, Paul not only asks the question, he answers them too. He compares our resurrection to a seed that is buried in the ground before sprouting new life. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. You know, this, this body is expendable. It's, you know, it's, it's really worthless, so to speak. It will be raised imperishable. Then he describes some specific changes we'll experience in our resurrected bodies. He says that, you know, we'll go from perishable to imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, and from a natural body to a supernatural body. Now, won't it be great to have a body like that? A body that never gets old, you know, never gets tired, a body that's defined by power and glory. Billy Graham once passed a shop that was no longer open for business, or, or it had really closed just for a while. A sign hung in the window that said, closed for renovations. The owner had closed it so he could remodel the store, make, make it look a lot better. And when he reopened his business with all the changes, Billy Graham says this is a picture of our death and resurrection. When we die, our spirit moves out of our body temporarily, okay? Until it's been repaired, until it's been remodeled. Then, at the resurrection, our spirit will move into our newly remodeled, indestructible, glorified, powerful, supernatural body. Now, what's a supernatural body? I don't know. But like the Thessalonians, I'm looking forward to finding out. You know, mighty churches eagerly await, you know, our resurrection. Furthermore, mighty churches look forward to a reunion. Now think about that. Paul's purpose in bringing up the resurrections seems to be the Thessalonians' concern of the ones that have already passed on, their loved ones that, that, that have died. He writes in verses 13 to 17, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
the point is that mighty churches not only look forward to the reunion, but to the reward. So let me uh, tell you about poor Fred. Fred arrived at the pearly gates a little nervous about being admitted into the heavenly city. Now, remember, this is fictitious here. Very quickly, he found himself standing before an impressive angelic being with a clipboard. Fred, the angel said, it would help the process if you could just share with me some experience from your life on earth when you did a purely unselfish, kindly deed. Well, Fred said, yes, I can do that. I was walking along the street and came upon a little old lady. She was being merci mercifully harassed by a motorcycle gang. So what did I do? I just stepped right up. I kicked over one of their motorcycles just to get their attention. Then I kicked one of them in the shin and told the old lady to run for help. The angel replied, you know, well, that, that qualifies. You know, when, when did this happen? And he said, oh, about three minutes ago. You know, <laughs> thankfully, if, if we've put our faith in Jesus, we won't have to prove our worth to get our reward. Rather, Paul assures us in 1 Thessalonians 5.10, He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, you know, alive or dead, we may live together with Him. And he says it more succinctly in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We will be with the Lord forever. This is the hope of every believer. Life without end. Life everlasting. Life without limits. Through, <clears throat> throughout Jesus' ministry, he promised one thing. And you know, it's something no one else could offer. Eternal life. You know, think about it. Immor uh, immorali Im immortality. I'll get it out. Immortality. That's what Jesus came into this world to offer. Jesus declared boldly in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. That's what Jesus came into this world to do. Jesus uh, is telling us that he wants us to have a life without limits, without letdowns. You know, he's speaking of both quantity and quality and both of those beyond measure. Sometimes, you know, I, I don't want to tell you, break, break your bubble here, but sometimes life's not all it's cracked up to be. You know. But the life that Jesus gives will never disappoint. There'll be no more suffering, sadness, or pain, no more boredom, Bounce checks or bad moods, no more tantrums, tedium, or terrorists. The, 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 the translation of the Bible, the message, puts it this way. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. This, this was the reward the Thessalonians eagerly awaited. Paul wanted the Thessalonian church to see the coming of Christ as an encouragement. Whether or not it happens during our lifetime, it doesn't matter. We're all going to be resurrected on that day. We will be reunited with fellow believers of every age and rewarded with eternal life in the company of Christ. 
In the meantime, what's our job? Our job is to be prepared. And Paul cautioned the church in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 2. He says, now brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And it's quite interesting people that try to figure out when Jesus is coming. You can go online and Google this and you can come up with all sorts of formulas. They use the Bible to, to get that exact date and when they come up, they always say, and then you add a two or you add a three in order to make it the number that they want. We don't know when he's coming. It doesn't matter when he's coming. We just have to be prepared. Now, while on the South Pole expedition, on a South Pole expedition, British explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton, he left some men on Elephant Island, promising that he would return. You know, and, and you know that this is at the South Pole. There's nothing there. Later, when he tried to get back, huge icebergs blocked the way. But suddenly, as if by a miracle, an avenue opened in the ice and he was able to get his ship to his men. And when he arrived, he found them ready and waiting right there at the dock. They quickly scrambled aboard and no sooner had the ship left and cleared the island than the ice closed in behind them. Now, contemplating their narrow escape, Shackleton asked his men, it was fortunate that you were all packed and ready to go. And they replied, we never gave up hope. Whenever the sea was clear of ice, we would roll up our sleeping bags and remind each other, the boss may come today. You know, there is no predicting when Jesus will return. So this is a major point of a mighty church. It is to be packed and ready to go at all times. And the question today is, are you ready? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? You know, if not, it's time to start packing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today recognizing your glory and your power. We've seen it this week with all of the problems that we've had, with all the outpouring of love from people that, that have helped. And we just thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, that you care about us so much that you would come back to this world and take us to be with you. And we just praise your holy name, thanking you, and just anticipating your return. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.